Good morning. Good seeing you this morning. Praise the Lord that uh, we can be here uh, on this Lincoln's birthday. Jason's 35th birthday. Uh-huh. And he's our second to the youngest. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Amen. And uh, happy Valentine's Day for Tuesday. Tremendous. You know. What's that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. People think of Valentine's Day, they think about the Valentine's Day massacre. No, anyway, that's a... <laughs> anyway, what a welcome. <laughs> welcome you here this morning. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome those who are on YouTube. Praise the Lord. Anyone who's a first-time visitor, you'll notice... Extra flap there, that's our visitor's card. Appreciate it if you fill it out and take that off and put it on the back table. We have a record of your visit this morning. We will have a Valentine's Day potluck. Uh, that'll be actually on February 19th, which is what, next Sunday? Wow, after the morning service. Okay. And so that'd be tremendous. A Lifeline screening will be here on Thursday, March the 2nd. So for those who'd like to take advantage of that, men's breakfast will be on March the 5th. So that's tremendous. And then, of course, that lovely time on March the 12th, we spring forward again. We have the time change. We lose an hour. So we got to adjust how many did I say last year had 11 or 12 clocks to adjust at home or something? <laughs> so, need less clocks. Uh, end of the year giving statements are still on the back table and uh, ready for you to pick up. Uh, Easter is early this year, April the 9th. If you'd be willing to help with the Easter breakfast, please let the office know. I am sure that the music people are thinking about that. Okay, so working on that. The reading being from 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 24, my Bible does title it, Live as You Are Called. So I guess that's part of our calling. So the scripture says, but as God has distributed to each one, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches, was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. You are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Let's pray. Lord God, just pray that we will take these words to heart and truly live and act according to how you would have us to in, in your plan where we found ourselves in life. Um, as we learned this morning, obeying what you've commanded us to, knowing that you have the plan for us and that we are able to act where you have us situated each day. And just pray that we will, yeah, just that you'll prepare our hearts for the message today and we'll all accept what you have for us from there, Lord. Amen. We continue our study in Titus, Titus chapter 2. By the way, that was a Tommy Dorsey song he wrote in 1938. The band leader. Might have been before some of your time, but I mean, <laughs> back in the day, the big band, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller, you know, those type of people. Now, that's true. <laughs> yeah, Tommy Dorsey is a great trumpeter, he really was. It's good. All right, the trumpet band, that's right, bands. 
they weren't high on violins back then, so big swing music. Titus chapter 2, many people spend their whole lives trying to escape the situation they're in. And that's all they accomplish in their life, trying to escape the situation they're in, whether it might be poverty or might be uh, servitude or whatever. And many people miss life because they're trying to escape the life that they're living. So Paul, some advice for him that's counterintuitive to our sensibilities, but it's very important advice. And that's why I had Robert Reed from the section 1 Corinthians in 7, he gives the same advice. In so, chapter 2 and verse 9, exhort to be obedient to their own masters, to be well pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Social injustice came with the fall. And so after the flood, we see several things that the Lord actually encoded in the Word of God, which would not have been encoded before the fall. Uh, polygamy, for one thing, was never part of God's plan. A man shall leave you know, his mother and father and cleave to what? His wife, the one wife. But they have all bu a whole bunch of rules dealing with servitude and your servants. As a matter of fact, we're told Abraham, at that point was Abram, went to Terah and collect many persons. <laughs> They were part of his family, but they were servants. And a lot of these servants, if they had no way of earning a living, would have died without servitude. And that's where we have the parable, remember, of the prodigal son, where when he comes to himself, says, even my servants have a plenty to eat, I'll go back and... Tell my father I'll be one of his servants. <laughs> During Paul's time to uh, Gibbons in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, he said one third of the Roman Empire were slaves. Out of about 180 million people, about 60 million were, were slaves. Now the God strong root amongst the slaves population as it did in the southern part of the United States before the Civil War because the one thing the gospel gives is hope, right? It gives hope of eventual freedom and redemption. Now, chain did not change their status as slaves. They came to Christ were still servants. So what do we do now? He said, listen, can, can I get, matter of fact, that's in 1 Corinthians 7, it says, if you can be free, that's fine, but don't worry about that. We're going to talk about that. And all slaves who would be owned by Christian masters. Say, well, this master is a Christian. He should free me. Matter of fact, when we get to Philemon, that whole book is about that because Philemon's slave had run away, <clears throat> Onesimus, and uh, and Paul talks to him about that. We're going to, we're going to look at that in the next book. Uh, that was one of the testimonies why. Frederick Douglass turned away from the church because his master over in the Eastern Shore had come to know the Lord said, surely I get at least better treatment and it didn't happen, it didn't mean anything in this man's life. It was probably just an emotional revival. So Frederick Douglass soured on the 
church in his testimony up from slavery. And so sort of inconsistent with faith, uh, faith, but it is uh, occurred frequently, it does today, and it is part of the world. It's part of the fallen world we live in. And uh, the whole history of the world is full of examples of servitude. That's where the long pigtails, you know, came in China and serfs in Europe. And many of our ancestors were serfs. There's just nothing more than slaves, in a sense. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, was sold into Egypt and became a slave. Eventually a prisoner. <laughs> and so Paul says something that perhaps we would think is surprising. By the, by the way, there was a whole movement back in the 60s and 70s spearheaded by the Jesuits in Latin America, liberation theology, that Jesus came to set people physically free and stuff like that, and so they warped the gospel message that way. Now Paul not to be bitter against their masters or their bondage, but use it as a testimony, and that's a different twist than the way they were thinking. He says, you are in a position to be a testimony to your master. Matter of fact, one of the things Paul does later on in his life is the fact when he is captured and taken to Rome, he gives testimony that he had led many of the servants in the palace to the Lord, and the gospel was being spread through Nero's palace right under his nose through these servants. They're in positions of influence, even though they were servants, that Paul could not even use because he wasn't in their positions. We find in 2 Kings chapter 5 of an unnamed girl who was taken captive from Israel by the Assyrian general Naaman, and she tells her Mistress, Naaman's wife, if Naaman could, uh, my master could only go down to Israel, there's a prophet down there that could heal him of his leprosy. <laughs> of course, the prophet wouldn't heal him, but it would be God healing him. It's kind of because the fact that she probably lost her family, probably were killed in this raid, we don't know. She would think this little girl would be bitter, but instead she decided to be a testimony for God where she was. And because of her testimony, Naaman not only gets healed, but he comes to faith, even to the point that let me take a little bit of Israel's dirt back so I'll make my own little prayer spot to worship the Lord. <laughs> Because the little girl refused to be bitter, she said, well, if God has placed me here, I will be used by God here. And so it was a slave that pulled Jeremiah out of the cistern so he wouldn't drown. And so, matter of fact, his name was Melech Ebed, Eb Ebed which means uh, servant of the king. <laughs> And so Paul stated that, 1 Corinthians 7, that what Robert read, Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, you know, if you're a slave, don't worry about that. <laughs> you're God's freeman. If you are, you're God's slave, Christ's slave. He said, if you're married, that's great. But if you're not married, that's fine. And, and you know, if you're rich, that's fine, but if you're poor, that's fine because everything in this world is, yeah, temporary, passing away, and eternity, we are not going to be known by whatever we were down here. 
Matter of fact, in eternity, we're going to find that a lot of the people who are big shots down here aren't so big shots up there. And some of the most humble of the people, uh, ones who will be greatly rewarded there. Because this world is a very temporary, like a vapor. We're here today and going tomorrow. And matter of fact, you know, as Todd has often mentions, Rahab will probably drop her title. <laughs> she would no longer be known as Rahab the harlot. Yeah. <laughs> and so all things here. Matter of fact, Jesus made the point. He said, listen. We don't marry, we're like the angels, we don't marry or given in marriage in there. Now, all that's just something for this, this life here. And so here, whether you're strong or weak, whether you're famous or not famous, or whether you're rich or poor, whether you're a servant or a master, it doesn't matter. None of that will go into eternity. Matter of fact, that's why Solomon took 12 chapters to cry about losing his wealth in the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> what do you mean I can't take it with you? <laughs> what do you mean? And so these are temporary situations which has absolutely no impact on eternity. Matter of fact, we're told over in Isaiah chapter 65 in verse 17 that we only remember this world, neither world will come to mind. We won't remember any of the slights or any of the problems, everything. There's only two things in eternity which will remind us of the life down here. Number one, Jesus will still have the prints in his hands and his feet and his side. And secondly, the word of God lasts forever, right? And so temporary Spend time fretting over earthly situations, lacks faith and for and obedience to our calling. If you, if we spend time worrying about our situation, we cannot be spending time worshiping and serving the Lord. You can't do both. Matter of fact, uh, John Wesley was once walking with a guy who's complaining about this and complaining about that and complaining about this. And John Wesley just out of the blue stops and, and, and looks over in the field and says, why is that cow looking over the fence? The guy said, what? He said, what do you mean? Why is that cow looking over the fence? He said, well, why? He says, because he can't see through the fence. He says, you can't see God because you're still looking at your problems. You've got to look over your problems and see the Lord that leads you through the problem. I thought it was a great illustration. I thought, wow. You know, he just, uh, you know, the Lord just gave him that, right? Because he can't see through the fence. I had some cow jokes, but I'm moving on. Um. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Uh, so instead of conditions, the Lord conditions that we're in and use that as a testimony to others. And see what cause no situation that you're in. If you didn't place yourself there, God needed to be there for a purpose. We have to understand that. That's why Paul said to the Corinthians, or in 2 Corinthians 1, he says, listen, the Lord go through all this suffering so he might comfort me so I are going through the same thing and by the way it's in seven verses he uses the word comfort or consolation same word ten times <laughs> as only Paul can do you know and so he gives us a long suffering here so there's a tendency for the slaves to shirk their responsibilities, give them to them to steal, to badmouth their masters, to undermine their masters' interests. Don't do that. Don't be bitter at your situation, your enslavement. Yes, it's unfair. Don't be bitter, but say, God put me here for a purpose and a reason, and I'm going to use it for his glory. So 
looks of a situation, which is natural to do, that we, that we, we treat ourselves as a victim, he says, only adds to the tribulation. Have you ever noticed if you bemoan your suffering, you suffer more? <laughs> if you do what oh, I'm suffering, yet will I trust him, right? Yet will I praise him. It actually encourages you in the suffering and it gives you a testimony to those who are watching you. One, which is not very often pointed out, but one of the most amazing things about the book of Job is Job did not allow these three guys to beat him down. He did say miserable comforters are you, but he, he did not allow them to move him from his faith. So Paul calls upon the servant to be obedient to the masters which is counterintuitive to our nature because that testimony is going to be a testimony to the master. Say, wow, there's a change in your life. Just like Joseph was such a tremendous servant, he became the head of all the household. He was such a tremendous prisoner, he was run to prison, which that's kind of unique. <laughs> and put him in a position to finally become second in command and Egypt. <laughs> and so in this position that you're in that's not of your own making it was there by accident God had a purpose in this if you're in a bad situation and you can praise the Lord in a bad situation that's a greater testimony than people praising the Lord who's doing well <laughs> Why well, are you still praising the Lord even though you're suffering this? It might be what physical, it might be, you know, it might be your job situation, it might be your financial situation, but you still can praise the Lord. That's a tremendous testimony. So Paul servant. If you're a servant, be the very best servant you can be. Wow. Now that's not worldly wisdom. What do you mean? I've been, been and you know, I've been properly enslaved and I've been sold and stuff like that. So, well, be the very best. Of you. If you're planted there, you know, Richard Baxter, the Puritan preacher, asked, what do you do if you're going to prison? He says, I'll move my pulpit to the prison. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to complain, but I'm, if, if the Lord wants to be in prison, I'll preach to the prisoners. And so he understood that he is moved not by the will of man, but by the hand of God. To be used by God. Whatever. And so God has a purpose in it all, even if we can't see it right now. We don't have to. The Lord And it's not an accident. Listen, I want you, as a servant, you've come to the Lord. I want you to be honest. I want you to be cheerful. I want you to be faithful. I want you to be helpful, obedient, responsible. I want you to be loyal to your master. <laughs> Listen, because you're doing it for the Lord. If I'm going to be a servant of the Lord, I've got to learn how to be servant of men. And so to serve Men unto the Lord is serving the Lord as I'm serving men. See, that's a concept. Now, I'm going to be the very best in my situation that I could be. This is where the Lord has placed me. I'm going to be a testimony where the Lord has placed me. Even if it's unfair. Even if it's legally not right. He said, if the Lord placed you here, do the Lord. That's, that's basically his kind of Interesting that he tells the wife the same thing, or in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, to obey their masters as what? Unto the Lord. Serve as unto the Lord. He says, if there's things that we don't like to do, but it has to be done, do it as what? Unto the Lord. I say, Lord, is this what you want to do? I'll do this. I mean, I guarantee you that if you were to interview Paul, 
he would not say, boy, I love suffering. <laughs> I love to be whipped and scourged and beat and everything else. No, that's not where his joy was. His joy was he was suffering for the Lord. He was suffering as he was given a testimony, right? As he's given a witness. It wasn't a fact he loved to be scourged so much and loved to be beaten with rods and thrown in prison. It was the fact that this was in connection with him being a testimony for the Lord. And the joy he was suffering with Christ because he was suffering for Christ. And the Lord is the one who strengthens him. And that's what, it, that's what the whole point was. And so he said, I want you to be the very best he, because God wants to use us where he places us. The old saying is the fact that bloom where you are planted. <laughs> if that's where you are, you know, and the old saying is the fact that the flowers grow best over the septic tank, but that's another, <laughs> that's another issue, right? <laughs> And so in 10, 13, it says, listen, nothing's overtaken you. That's not common to man, but God is faithful that he will make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. In other words, nothing, nothing you've been put through hasn't been already ordained by God. <laughs> and he's going to strengthen you that nothing's going to overpower you because where the... Lord is, is stronger than whatever the trials are. <laughs> and so that's why in Romans 8, 28, where it talks about all things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose, a obedient servant will always be able to understand that God has used them, even though they don't see it now, for something that's going to be for his glory. Even though they're going through Difficult situations. First Peter 4, I, you know, I love what Peter says here. He says, don't think it's a strange thing when fiery trials come upon you. This is common. He said, now make sure you're not being suffering as a busybody or, you know, doing something evil. But he says, listen, if you're in the Lord, these things are going to happen. Matter of fact, Jesus gave us that promise. Yeah. Not a promise we like take joyfully, but he says, in this word, you're going to have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so he said, this is normal. Uh, if we're not having tribulation in our lives at some point, in some way, it's a fact we're probably not a testimony either. Satan's not bothering with us. So instead, a situation that's inescapable, seek how God can use you as a testimony in the situation. Look for the opportunity. It's okay, Lord, you placed me here. I can't get out of this. I must, I must trust that there's some reason for it, right? There's some reason why I'm here in this situation, whatever that situation is. And Lord, I just want you to use me. Just show me Show me what it is that you want. And it's amazing. I mean, it took a long time. If you read uh, Johnny Erickson Tata's testament, it took her a long time to come to that point. That, you know, you know, you know, she played over and over again. If, if she didn't jump into, she was up here in Chesapeake Bay, right up near Lutherville. If she didn't jump into the bay, it's low tide. She hits her head. It's only three feet at that time, you know, and she breaks her neck. Said, if I, I could, let me take that back. Let me take that back. I forget which major it was that shut down in Vietnam. He says for for months he kept saying, "Lord, let me have that over again. I'll zig instead of zag." You know, <laughs> doesn't work that way. Whatever situation we're in, no matter what the reason for it, say, "Okay, Lord, I'm in this situation. What do you want to do with me in this situation?" And so instead of trying, if we joyfully serve the Lord, praising him under whatever pressure it is, it produces the greatest testimony of faith. 
Well, I can praise the Lord when you're going through this stuff because he's the God of the universe. It's only a temporary thing. And God says, I want you to use you here. As a matter of fact, that's why Paul had to come to himself when the thorn is in the flesh, right? Second Corinthians 12. He says, my grace is sufficient. I'm going to use you with the thorn in the flesh. <laughs> you know. And so the thorns he sends in our flesh is a reminder, you're just a man, you're just a woman, you're just a person. I'm the one doing these things. Not you, I'm just using you. But it's the Lord, we can do nothing. Matter of fact, Jesus said that, right? In John 15, 5, he says, without me, you can do what? Nothing. Can't do anything without me. When you have a bad boss, when you have poor health, you've suffered a great loss, the reversal of your fortune, sore disappointments, these are all tests of faith. Commitment. You know, Proverbs says, if we faint in the day of trouble, our strength is small. <laughs> Anyone can praise the Lord when things are going well, right? <laughs> It's when things get kind of rough, you say, are you still praising the Lord? That's what the whole book of Job's about. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure he's praising you. You put a hedge of protection around him. I mean, after all, get, remove that hedge, let me at him, and he'll curse you. When everything was taken away from Job, all his children and wealth and everything else, he says, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> now, that's faith. <laughs> that's really faith. And so, just like Job was sorely tested, whatever your test of faith is, the Lord has a reason for it. We're going to be talking about that next week when we look at the uh, Zarephath widow when she loses her son. He said, the Lord had a purpose, had a reason for it. And so Joseph became the very best slave. He said, you know, he, he was a he was a prince in his household. He became the very best servant and slave he can be. He was so trustworthy and honest that it said that Potiphar only knew what was placed in front to eat. He just left everything to Joseph. He didn't have to worry about because Joseph, he knew, was honest. He would take care of it, but he would promote his best interest. He could even trust his wife with Joseph. But that's another story. And even though he's innocent, now listen, one of the most intriguing parts of the story of Joseph is the fact he hadn't done anything wrong, right? It wasn't the fact that he was already a slave or servant. He became one. He figured that God must have some reason for it. Now, now, now let me tell you, that's not natural, is it? When things go wrong, we all, you know, this is going to tear me and everything else and look what they've done and everything else. I, I mean, that's normally how we react. But so does the rest of the world. To say, hey, you know, this is really bad situation. Praise God. <laughs> Not like the old bumper sticker, praise God anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I did. God has some reason for this, right? Praise the Lord. I want to be used in this situation. There's a reason. I'm looking for the blessing on the other side of the troubled waters. God always has a safe harbor. So we must Lord. Okay, God, how do you want to use me in this trial? What do you want to want me to learn? Rather than out of this now? Like the guy who didn't like the training and patience, he says, hurry up, Lord, learn patience so I can get out of it. Well, he's not learning the patience. <laughs> if we can solve or escape, that's fine. But if not, we have to cope and praise the Lord. Everyone is given a cross to bear. We need to bear it well. Now, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 11 and 12, emphasizes this point. He tells us, listen, we apostles and disciples from the Lord are hungry, 
We thirst. We've been abused. We've been beaten. You know, we have been incarcerated. And yet, beaten and abused and hungry and thirsty, we praise. We bless. We endure. We entreat and encourage others. We have to ask, what is our response? To tribulation. Do we understand it's from the hand of God? Are we willing to be used in it? This little girl, six weeks old, Fanny Crosby, born in 1820. At six weeks old, she had an oozing eye infection, and the incompetent doctor put mustard packs on her eyes and blinded her. She grew up, instead of being bitter, she praised the Lord. She wrote over 9,500 hymns. Still have many of them in our hymn book. And many of them had to do with sight. And she said, don't pity me because the very first sight I see is Jesus Christ. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. I see him. You know? The situation might not be your choice. Your response always is. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and for the privilege of being here. We just pray, Lord, that you draw us ever closer to you, that our responses might be honoring to you, that we might look to see how you can use us even in the midst of tribulation. And Lord, we have to know three things. Number one, you're in charge. And for those who've never come to faith, Lord, they need to come to that realization. Number two, you always have a purpose. You always have a reason. And number three, you want to use us for your glory. And this is a temporary situation we go through, but it's definitely a testing ground of faith. Lord, I pray, Lord, I don't know what each and every person here is going through or what they'll face in the future. But I know that you'll be there to meet them. And Lord, as anyone that's listening to this message that does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, may this be the day of salvation, that they might know the God who supersedes all trouble and leads the way. Because then we will know, as the songwriter wrote, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In each service, I'd like to give a brief outline. Three basic points. One, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so this man is totally lost. No matter what he believes, he's lost because he can't enter heaven because evil can't dwell with God. And so since we're made in the image of God, and so this image is cast into this lake of fire. However, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He put that bridge across here, and that's Jesus Christ. He who believes in the son has life. He who does not believe in the son does not have life. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but through him.